Good morning, everybody. And like, I'd like to uh, thank you, the organizers, for inviting me here. Uh, this is my second time uh, here in this conference. In 12 years ago, I, I was here to give a kind of an overview talk about lang language assessment. And, and today I'll be um, somewhat more specific by focusing on certain types of uh, types of um, assessment that, that we uh, hope and believe uh, sort of support uh, learning um, in, in certain ways. So um, this is a kind of a general outline of my talk. I'll briefly uh, discuss uh, the road to the, uh, the current emphasis and interest and uh, growing interest in um, assessment of uh, foreign and second language uh, skills that aim directly at supporting learning and, and, and teaching. And I'll, I'll focus on, uh, on our recent uh, project, DD Lang, it's, it's the name. It's a four year project and we are now uh, in the second year of, of, of the project. So we have some, some time to go. And that sort of tries to actually uh, uh, operationalize lights the ideas that I'm going to talk about today. And, and co I'll cover the um, the um, project a little bit. Uh, present some some examples of of the um, of the findings, and uh, and actually I'll at the end I'll have the uh, URL of the of our project website because we have actually uploaded uh, a number of previous presentations, so you'll actually have access to a number of um, concrete examples of of the things that I'm not going to go in, into in any in, in detail today. Um, so um, when we think about the kind of a, this is a kind of a very broad, crude or, um, general overview of, of some of the developments in language assessment. As, as, as you know, uh, most of the um, emphasis in the past decades has been in the large scale important examinations for, for certification purposes for end of school um, um, leaving exam, exam, examinations. Um, often the focus has been on the very kind of a technical aspects of, of these examinations, their reliability, uh, their um, internal structure, uh, um, how well they can predict the kind of things that they want to predict. And, and uh, what's been typical of these examinations is that they have often uh, employed a rather limited set of different kinds of uh, uh, assessment tasks, most notably multiple choice uh, standardized um, uh, interviews, um, essays, competitions and so on, uh, which have been uh, analyzed statistically to find out about their qualities. So uh, quite a few things have changed over the decades. Uh, our understanding of, of language and what it means to know language from knowledge of language to actually being able to use it for communicative purposes is, is one uh, very clear change over the decades. Uh, our view of validity has moved on from the kind of more technical structural aspects of validity uh, to uh, encompass more holistic views of validity uh, to cover uh, things like impact of validity on, on, um, on learning and and a larger uh, sort of uh, phenomena um, on to um, authenticity, ecological validity, ethical uh, considerations, fairness are now included when we talk about the quality of, of assessment and what, what actually validity and validation mean. And also the uh, emphasis in what uh, language testing and assessment people actually research has moved on not only from these high stakes gatekeeping examinations to, to kind of assessments that, that aim at supporting learning. I mean, we haven't obviously forgotten uh, the importance of, of examinations and actually my own career re reflects this. I, I used to be one of the designers of, the, of the, our national uh, certificates of proficiency, which is the uh, language uh, examination for adult language learners and nowadays mostly used by by those uh, immigrants who want to uh, show their required proficiency in, in Finnish or Swedish for citizenship purposes. But then uh, over the past 15 years, I've actually moved to 
uh, to the kind of an areas that I'll focus today. Okay. So these are the kind of uh, types of assessment that I'll, I'll briefly cover that led to our project. I'll be talking about what's called formative assessment, then two types of diagnostic assessment and, and dynamic assessment. So the first uh, strand is the uh, general, um, the, the kind of an assessment that we call formative assessment. I'll, I'll discuss this uh, in, mo in some more detail in, in, a, in a minute. This is, this is what typically happens in, in the schools, uh, and it's um, based on, on educational research, educational theories, uh, also language assessment considerations, uh, pedagogical considerations. So this has been around for, for ages, and it's been actually uh, covered in the literature since at least 1960s. Uh, the, uh, my own background is in, the, in what I would call a diagnostic assessment that is based on second language acquisition research and then language testing research, so coming together of, of these two, two sort of areas. And I'll, I'll cover this in more, more detail in, in a while. There's also a specific type of diagnostic assessment called cognitive diagnostic assessment which uh, we actually haven't much used in, in our current project. It, it may be that we have, we have chances of doing that, but what our project is mostly bringing together are the, uh, the, uh, this first type of diagnostic assessment based on language testing research and SLA research, and what we, what we call a dynamic assessment, which is based on social cultural theory and, and developmental psychology. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain uh, why those two are the key parts in, in this. So formative assessment first. This is a kind of a general background. Uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, assessment that happens in the schools all the time by teachers, uh, consciously and also un unconsciously. Uh, it, uh, comes with other, other names as well. You may be familiar with the terms assessment for learning or assessment as learning or learning oriented assessment. So these are uh, with different types of emphasis. Uh, they are talking about the same, same type, of, type of assessment. I, I don't go into the details here because formative assessment is a kind of a general background of why, why we feel uh, that what we do uh, sort of makes sense and why, why sort of uh, it was some, somehow in the air in, in the past 15, 15 years. So what is typical of formative assessment? This is very familiar to everybody, is that it uh, happens in the classroom, typically by the teacher, but also often involves self-assessment, peer assessment by the students. It uh, makes use of a range of different methods, uh, including observation by the teacher, all kind of quizzes, small tests, uh, portfolio assessment, perhaps learning diaries, um, everything that can yield information about learning. It's often done, you know, and typically done in on, on a continuous basis from the start to the middle to the end of the, of the teaching periods uh, or units. And it provides feedback to learners, obviously, and, and to the teachers as well. And what is important is be long acknowledged, and there's research to support this, uh, Black and William article is, is the classic one here. If formative assessment is done systematically, it, it can significantly improve learning. Uh, but if not done systematically, it may not have any, any effect. Uh, there's a plenty of literature on, on this, so I just picked some of, some of those here. So uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of um, formative assessment, typically. So, of course, it's, it's something that can is, and is implemented as part of the regular uh, teaching and, and learning in the courses. Uh, and importantly, if, the, if and when the teacher knows the learners, of course, the teacher has, has uh, an understanding of, of the learning paths and, and the history of, of the learners. So, so it's not just 
uh, kind of a once uh, one meeting with, with, with the learners, but actually ideally and most teachers in many contexts, they, they actually work with the same learners over months or even years. So they, they get to know their the learners. And when it's done, formative assessment is done systematically by using uh, multiple methods over time, it can actually, um, it, it can actually cover uh, much more ground than any one test can, because any one test always has a limited amount of time. It's, it's typically administered at one point in time, so all kinds of things can affect the kind of um, picture you get uh, from, from the learner, about the learners uh, uh, and, and their strengths and weaknesses. So weaknesses include that actually what often happens in the classroom is not well informed by theory and research into whatever is being, being taught and, and learned in the, in, the, in the languages, for example. Uh, it's typically based on, on curriculum, textbook, and, and it's as good as those curriculum textbooks are. Of course, those may themselves be based on solid research and, and theorization, but, but I mean, the picture probably varies a lot. This is difficult uh, with large groups of learners because one teacher, 30, 40 uh, students, even if the teacher knows them, I mean, it's very challenging. And it's, it's known that, for example, uh, classroom observations are, are very patchy and, and sort of can be rather biased. So it's very challenging for teachers to systematically observe uh, learner behavior and, and, uh, uh, and learning in, in the classrooms. So there are a number of challenges. So this diagnostic language assessment that I come from uh, started with the creation of the Dialang system. And actually, if you Google for Dialang, if you, if you haven't ever, ever tried it, please do. It's, it's a very interesting one. It's, it's quite old now. It was completed in 2004, but it's still available through the website at Lancaster University. It's a multilingual online system uh, in, in covers 14 different languages. Um, unfortunately, not Estonian because Estonian wasn't, I think Estonia, Estonian, Estonia was, wasn't part of the EU uh, at the time when, 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 when we started do, doing that. Uh, it involves um, language tests, self-assessments, and it provides a rich, rich feedback. But one of the uh, things that we realized when doing research on actually development work and research on, on dialing was that we didn't really uh, understand what diagnostic or diagnosis actually, or useful diagnosis actually is about. So we realized that there's a need for a lot of research into this and also some sort of conceptual work. And, and um, what is typical of diagnostic uh, testing, which is based on SLA research and, and language testing, uh, is that it, uh, well, tries to uh, identify learner strengths and weaknesses as, as clearly and precisely as possible with reference to clearly defined skills or constructs uh, involved there. And, and it aims at providing detailed feedback. And it's been uh, um, Lancaster University and uh, my own university have been, um, well, also elsewhere, but Lancaster and, and Yvaskula have been the two places where we have tried to, uh, well, we have carried out res research that paves way to hopefully better diagnostic assessments and, and also um, done some conceptual work to, to, to improve our thinking, take it, take it further from, from the times of dialing. One example of this is the, this is the Lancaster, uh, Charles Alderson, Tineke Brandfor and Luke Harding. Uh, they, um, that's a very in interesting article where they uh, envisaged the kind of an idealized um, diagnostic procedure where in the classroom it starts by the, the teacher listening and observing and noting that something is amiss with uh, some of the learners in some of the tasks and so on. So the, the teacher uh, makes a kind of an initial assessment, forms a kind of a hypothesis about what, what is the weakness and what, 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 what might be specifically 
sort of the problem in 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 somebody's uh, performance and 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 development and then it pro uh, the the teacher ideally proceeds to to actually uh, verifying the hypothesis uh, which can actually involve um, self assessment the section and then actually specifically designed uh, diagnostic uh, tasks which um, uh, which um, have, well, have been professionally developed of course this is the ideal world i mean there are very very few cases where we have access to such such um, sort of tools and then what follows is the diagnostic decisions and, and feedback about wh what what to do next uh, another way to uh, to understand this is a kind of a another kind of a diagnostic cycle or or process uh, which which we have developed uh, initially with Charles Alderson in our with our, in our book 10 years ago about diagnosing reading and this is the most recent one focusing on diagnosing writing so basically the the idea here is that uh, the we shouldn't we should always start with the idea of uh, understanding what we are uh, ass assessing and that's particularly important for the kind of assessment that, that um, support learning. Uh, then we either create or if we are lucky we have available some tools uh, which may not be just tests but they may be assessment scales focusing on specific aspects of re 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 writing and speaking for example. Uh, we may be focusing on the products of let's say writing the text or we may be focusing on the process of by which the text was was um, actually produced by the learner for example whether the learner uh, did any planning to the text whether the learner how, how the learner went about uh, formulating the text actually writing it and did the learner do anything after completing the text did he or she uh, actually um, uh, revise, review and revise it anyway. So those are the kind of aspects of, of the process of writing that we could focus on and, and provide feedback and, and support to the learner. And then what is important is that uh, the diagnosis and assessment shouldn't stop here with the feedback. It should follow to some meaningful action and that is all, all often the kind of a challenge with all kinds of formative types of assessment that Actually, we get some information, but the question is what, what to do and how to do after, after that. And uh, ideally, this is the, uh, our assessment shouldn't stop at, at the feedback state, but we should go on to action. And then uh, reviewing the, re, um, the successfulness or lack of it, of, of the action, uh, in order to, uh, to find out whether we should actually modify something in the next cycle and, and so on. So there are these kind of conceptual tools that we have developed in different places about how to understand what goes on ideally in, in such assessments that we are interested in. And there are some, some books on reading and uh, writing, diagnosing that have come up over the past uh, two, two decades. Um, so, uh, so certain strengths in diagnostic assessment, uh, for example, it's it's um, well, it's it's more more informed by by theoretical consideration. These are this, it's a very difficult area, especially when it comes to reading. I mean, we are still far from understanding fully how reading in a foreign language develops and and what what the kind of a key aspects of it. I mean, there's a lot of work on on that that is useful, but I, I still there's a long way to go go there. Writing is perhaps more sort of better understood as, as, as a skill because it's sort of it's sort of more visible and and, and you can actually um, at least uh, um, understand the different aspects of the products and give feedback on, on them and also there are ways to actually tap the, the writing processes as, as well so sometimes if we are lucky we have a, a good uh, procedures uh, tests um, available for diagnosis and importantly technology will, will is, is and will be something that actually helps here considerably. Uh, weaknesses include that actually diagnostic assessment does not automatically tell us 
what to do next in order to address the kind of weaknesses we have observed in, in learners' uh, uh, proficiency and, and learning. So its, its intended impact may remain low. And it's uh, still the case that, I mean, there are very few professionally developed uh, diagnostic tests um, av av available. So um, I'll, I'll perhaps go quickly through this because we haven't, haven't really um, made use of this in our, our um, sort of uh, project. But just to uh, tell you that there is another type of diagnostic assessment which is not based on second language acquisition or language testing research, but it comes from a more general cognitive psychology and educational measurement. It's called cognitive diagnostic assessment. It has been applied to uh, um, foreign and second language assessment. Yes, that's, that's right. Uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is important there too is, is as clear a definition of the assessed constructs as possible. And, and so they, uh, they actually, what the main difference between uh, the kind of diagnostic assessment that I come from and, and this is that uh, in the SLA-based diagnostic assessment, uh, we sort of uh, work with the understanding and hypothesis that let's say a particular reading uh, question or item uh, mainly uh, taps one type of reading, like for example, understanding the main idea. Uh, cognitive diagnostic assessment uh, does not make such assumption. It, it sort of assumes that uh, underlying any one uh, reading task, for example, uh, there may be more than one uh, subskill of, of reading involved, which, is, which makes sense. Uh, but uh, it's just a different kind of approach that we haven't yet um, ad adopted. So uh, in CDA, the uh, assumption is that any one test item or question can actually cover more than one important uh, uh, construct. So they, then the process here goes that mm, a CDA test is administered and then they apply very sophisticated statistical modeling to tease out information and, and then provide feedback to the learners. So basically, uh, if we think that there's a reading test that covers these three postulated um, aspects of reading, uh, the idea here is that uh, the, in the test design stage, the experts uh, try to uh, decide whether a particular item uh, covers one, two, or even three of these things, and then they produce a kind of a matrix of, of these, and this is then used in the, in the analysis. And the feedback to the learner, basically, this could be actually feedback from, from a regular diagnostic test as well, is that we have three different learners with the, uh, th kind of a profile of, of uh, strengths and weaknesses, and, and uh, here, uh, the mastery level of, of a particular um, construct has been set at 70%. That's a rather subjective uh, decision. So it's, it's difficult to say what, what would be the kind of a proper percentage of, uh, of, of a mastery uh, for a particular construct but before you can say that actually you actually know this construct. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the big challenges in assessment in, in general. So you can see the, the kind of a profile here that learner one happens to have achieved mastery on two of the three constructs, whereas learner three is, has already mastered everything. So this is a kind of an information that can be then used for, uh, for um, guiding further work. So um, basically, Strengths and weaknesses are in the CDA are about the same as in, in the regular um, cognitive, um, sorry, uh, diagnostic assessment, except that uh, see, this is uh, this requires much more sophisticated mastery of, of statistics than than the than the re regular one, uh, and and as, as you saw, it has the way it sort of understands what each individual items measure is, is somewhat different. But anyway, we haven't yet uh, managed to sort of fully employ this approach in our project. So what, what, but what we do is to, we, we try to merge together to the kind of a traditional diagnostic assessment and what is called dynamic assessment. Dynamic assessment is actually developed already 
uh, before the Second World War by, by Vygotsky. And it's been applied in psychological research, special education, and also elsewhere. And, and uh, in the past 20 years or so, it's been applied in the USA in particular into uh, second and foreign language education by, by Jim Landolf and Matthew Porner. And actually, Matt Porner is, is one of our collaborators in the project. So uh, it is based on a specific uh, psychological developmental theory uh, sociocultural approach to learning uh, by, by uh, Vygotsky, already developed in the 1920s and 30s, but it sort of has spread uh, um, outside the then Soviet Union only uh, after in the past few decades, and in, it's now also uh, gaining ground in, in second language uh, assessment and ed education. Not much, but, but significantly anyway. One of the um, theoretical uh, uh, key points in, in this is the zone of proximal development, which may be a term that many of you have heard about. And, and basically it's, it uh, sort of, it focuses on uh, the area where, I mean, um, learners can um, perform certain things independently as shown by regular tests. Uh, because the regular tests show what you can do without support on, on your own in the testing situation. Uh, but when you are given some assistance, some, let's say, graduated hints, uh, going from more general ones to the most uh, explicit ones, until you are either manage to uh, solve the problem, answer the question, or, or you fail, uh, but you are given the right, right answer, that uh, zone is called the zone of proximal development, and the theory argues that actually the learning uh, is most effective and focuses on, on in that uh, area of after what you know, but 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 before you actually reach the point where where you can't can't do any 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 anything even with support. Uh, so the forms of uh, dynamic assessment in general. Um, since the idea is that actually during the assessment session you actually get support if you can't manage on your own, means that actually integrated into the assessment cycle session is also uh, some sort of teaching and also learning because if, if you learn something during the teaching session, then, well, well, simply you learn some, something then. And, and this, uh, this is called, uh, this um, support is called mediation in in the, in the terminology of uh, social cultural theory. And it can be typically, it happens, typically it happens in interactionist uh, settings where there's a teacher and there's a learner and they interact one-to-one. -one. This is also possible to do at classroom level, uh, sort of dynamic assessment, but prototypically it's it's one-to-one -one interaction and, and where, where the teacher guides the learner towards uh, sort of solving the the problems. Of course, it can be done basic, theoretically and, and practically also on a computer, but you, you can think about the kind of challenges of applying this, this on a computer. But that's one of the things that we'll, we'll be doing here. These are quite, quite real. Uh, Jim Landolf and Matt Bonner did one interesting uh, application, computerized listening comprehension test uh, more than 10 years ago. And then my current colleague, Dimitri Leontiv, who is actually from Estonia, he's, he's the full-time researcher in, in our project. And he, he's, in his uh, doctoral dissertation eight years ago, he, he actually showed how a particular type of uh, uh, computerized dynamic assessment can, can work. So how does this happen? I mean, as already hinted, regular tests uh, don't involve any support. You answer the items and you get feedback only afterwards, either immediately after the test or sometime afterwards. So this measures, this measures your ability to do things on your own. Whereas dynamic assessment actually is, um, there's in, involved in this, this sort of interaction where, you, where learner is supported step by step towards um, solution. So the idea is that, um, well, I'll actually cover that next. So uh, when we think about the strengths of dynamic assessment is that there's a clearly 
a clear theory of development underlying this, un unless a lot of formative assessment. Uh, it combines mm, assessment and, and learning, at least in the assessment sessions, and perhaps beyond that. And importantly, it expands the scope of skills that are assessed from the, uh, from the mastery of, from the independent mastery of something to the kind of a supported or mediated mastery of, of something. So it sort of covers more, more ground, so to speak. It's particularly useful if you have one-to-one -one, uh, contexts. And, and there are some developments also uh, for second language contexts. Um, however, in the second language context, the, the applications of, uh, of dynamic assessment still lack a kind of a clear basis in L2 research on, on the constructs and, and their development. And, and it's difficult to apply uh, in a useful way on a computer, uh, because the, for a computer you have to actually write down the the pieces of advice from more general to the more more specific and 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 there's little sort of flexibility in in the way because computers are not human not 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 yet at least so uh so they, they that's a kind of a challenge there so let we move on to the dd lang project this brings these together so as, as mentioned in the uh, weaknesses of the various kind of approaches at least two things uh, come stand uh, there um, very clearly to be seen. One is that uh, often this kind of um, assessments are, are lacking in, in systematicity and, 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 and they have a weak basis in any kind of theory of, of learning and, and, and development and understanding of the constructs. And, and if we are dealing with a large group of learners, there's a challenge of, of individualization of assessment and, and feedback, how to do that. So obviously this, this uh, can affect negatively in the quality and impact of, of assessments, uh, including fairness. And, and it's possible that, that the kind of learners who need particular kind of support are not actually getting it because the measurement instruments are so blunt that they don't actually provide that information. So how do we do the address these issues? So we, one way is to do research on this, and this is what our project does. This is a four-year project uh, funded by our National uh, Research uh, Council of Finland, Suomen Akatemia, and, and of course our university. And it focuses on reading and writing development in the upper secondary schools in Finland, the, the so-called gymnasium. So that's, that's the focus group. So we have an international group of collaborators. The key ones are uh, well, actually, one of them from the U.S. have moved now to Spain, so there should be a star in Sp somewhere in Spain at, at the moment. So, um, these are the other people. So, we have a very good group of people who have done work on dynamic assessment on the one hand and on di diagnostic assessment on, on, the one, uh, on, the, on the other hand. So, um, some key collaborators include, um, well, this is Dimitri, my colleague, and, and then we have a, a research, uh, part-time research assistant who, who's not here. Then uh, we, this is Matthew Porner, the uh, the preeminent uh, expert on dynamic assessment at, at the moment. Then Lancaster University, Luke Harding, Tineke Brandford. We have long ties with Lancaster because of the uh, long-standing work on diagnostic assessment. And then there's uh, at Helsinki University, there's Roman Jan Garber, whose uh, online system we are using uh, for, for delivering computerized systems. So, uh, how do we address these issues of lack of systematicity, uh, lack of, uh, of basis in theory, and, and so on? So, we, we bring together uh, dynamic assessment and diagnostic assessment, which we covered uh, shortly, or just, just a minute ago. Uh, so, we try to bring the strengths of diagnostic assessment which which is which is um, strong in in uh, defining the constructs of interest and then we uh, bring in the dynamic assessment which has a clearly clearly developed theory of 
of, um, of development in general, although um, still how that applies to L L2 is, is, is a question. And of course, we, uh, when we integrate uh, the information that we obtain through the mediation in the dynamic assessment that covers more ground than uh, sort of regular tests, then, then we have a, have a chance of un understanding the, uh, the learners' um, current abilities and potential for development better. Uh, the second way, second way we actually uh, uh, address these uh, challenges is to, to combine uh, computerized and, and classroom-based assessment. So we have a certain task that we deliver on computer, and then we train uh, teachers, classroom teachers or English teachers to, uh, to apply uh, uh, dynamic assessment in the classroom and also to make use of the, uh, the information they get from the online exercises taken by their students. Uh, what happens, we, we still don't know because we are just sort of starting that phase of the, of the study. Uh, we are working with, uh, I'll focus on, on reading here, I'll, I'll skip uh, writing at, at the moment. So we have so-called broader constructs, reading constructs, like for example, inferring word meanings from the context, uh, understanding main idea, and, and some others. Uh, so we have tasks and mediation for these constructs. We have reading tasks that look like tests, that we call them exercises, because we are not, we are not actually delivering tests, and we don't want to call them tests for obvious reasons, because they are really exercises that, that, uh, that hope to take Learn, learners understanding of reading uh, and, and ability to read uh, further. So we have an um, online reading task and, and, and also obviously teachers work with reading in the classroom too. Then we have um, so-called narrow constructs which are more um, the kind of a grammatical and vocabulary categories like discourse markers, verb tenses, articles, which are mainly um, exercised through the online, ex uh, online system, uh, where these exercises are actually automatically created from texts by using natural language processing and, 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 and AI. And, and then what we have to do is to, we have to decide what kind of mediation support messages we want to, dis uh, to the system to display to the learners when they fail to, to answer correctly. So uh, how do we where do we find ideas and information about what, what the reading constructs are and also what the other constructs are? So obviously we do a th review of theories and results on L2 reading. We have done uh, online surveys of... Um, we are working with upper secondary school students whose uh, uh, school ends with the nationwide matriculation examination. So we have uh, surveyed the item writers for the matriculation examination foreign language tests in order to, uh, uh, to get their understanding of what is important in reading, what kind of reading tasks they, they design and what kind of read, reading construct they, they hope to measure with these tasks. And we asked a similar kind of questions from, from students. We had several hundred students last year who responded to our survey. Uh, and we had a number of uh, teachers who did the same. We have teacher interviews actually now, I think, more than 10 at the moment. And, and we also have uh, good readers in English to, to, um, to actually think aloud when doing some of the same reading tasks that, that we have worked with, with the others. Uh, we have designed, we are in the process of designing mediation, and I'll show you some examples of what we have, have come up with. And we have actually... Uh, piloted this, with this, this uh, reading mediation uh, uh, steps with uh, about 10 students who actually just recently took uh, their matriculation examination in, 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 in Finland and, and obtained their views on how they reacted to these, whether they thought these were useful and, 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 and other, well, similar things. So, um, right, I mean, there's a already plenty of uh, literature on not, I mean, reading in a first language is a huge field, but there's also a fair number of uh, book length treatments of, of what, is, what is assessment of reading, what is reading in, in, a, in a second language. 
So uh, just to show you what, what our research questions are, we are interested in, in finding out whether, whether, the, whether, whether, whether the bringing together dynamic diagnostic assessment in the project actually improves uh, um, students' uh, reading and writing skills, and also how useful the teachers and learners themselves find the kind of information about the, re the reading and writing profiles that they get. So, of course, these are things which make it very important that we, we try to define these constructs as, as clearly as, as possible. Uh, we also are interested in finding out uh, whether teachers' assessment practices in the classroom actually changed during the course of, of participating in the study. We are also interested in, in, in the, if the learners and teachers believes about such important things as, as what reading is, what writing is, what assessment is, what learning is, what teaching is, whether, whether their uh, beliefs about those change at all during, during engagement with us. And of course, we, we want to find out whether, whether there's uh, some theoretical contribution to assessment literature by what we, what we did. So the design is a longitudinal intervention where we have a control, control schools and experimental schools. And these experimental schools are, are the ones that actually uh, get the full treatment. They, they get um, to uh, take part in the... The students can, can voluntarily take the, uh, the online exercises uh, according to their own motivation and, and wishes and so on. And, and they get the mediate mediation uh, attached to the task. So they, they get everything that we can think might, might help them. And also in, it's in these experimental schools, the teachers are trained to uh, use uh, um, dynamic assessment. And actually, it's, it's not just training, but we, we collaborate with them. So it's a kind of an, a researcher-teacher uh, partnership that we, we are working uh, in so that we want to learn from them what works, what, what their challenges are, and we hopefully can sort of uh, raise their awareness of what, what, for example, research has to say about reading and writing and, and, and assessment. And, and they, uh, the, uh, the online system is this, uh, this Revita that, that I mentioned. I'll, I'll show a couple of slides about that as well. And the control group, they basically uh, the, their teachers don't get any further, I mean, further support and training. Uh, they, uh, they can take, uh, the students there, there can take as much of the Revita exercises, but we, without the kind of mediation feedback, with a kind of regular correct, incorrect type of feedback that you get. Some findings. So um, this is an example from the teacher uh, student survey. Uh, we asked them to uh, an open-ended question, I mean, they could define in their own words. Think about a person who is a good reader in English. What can such a person do, in your opinion? We did a content analysis. And what comes up uh, is that um, vocabulary, um, they think that a good reader is somebody who has got good vocabulary knowledge. Reading is vocabulary. It's also, I mean, re a good reader is somebody who understands texts well. I mean, these are rather general in on the one hand, and also rather specific. Reading is about vocabulary. What was surprising was that pronunciation came up uh, quite a lot. We, we believe this is because it's often the case that actually uh, students, even up, up in secondary school, they often read texts aloud uh, in, in several uh, of, the, of their sessions. So, I, I can't, well, we, we, this is the only the logical explanation for that. And of course, there are other, other things that they come up. Uh, what, when we ask the teachers the similar say, uh, question, lukio means gymnasium in Finnish. So what, what should the students be able to do or know to be a good reader in English? And also, I mean, this is just the 30, uh, 39 of the, I mean, we haven't, covered all the responses yet. So, but vocabulary knowledge also is, according to teachers, uh, the prominent skill. Of course, teachers have a more nuanced understanding of this. But what struck us is that, as we suspected, uh, uh, reading in a foreign language, uh, how to develop reading, how to understand reading, remains a kind of an unknown black box to 
many most students in particular but also many teachers and it seems to f they seem to think that reading is about vocabulary and, and that when you develop reading you should read more you should develop your vocabulary and that's that's in a nutshell what it is so we perhaps want to raise their awareness through this project that perhaps there is some something something more to reading than these these things uh, just show you an example of we included in the questionnaires we included uh, some uh, reading tasks uh, and and we asked the as the as the learners to pick from a list of potential potential challenges uh, those that when they actually tried to answer this question what kind of challenges problems they encountered and 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 we we, we get a certain profile for example for this particular one uh, they thought that okay they, they had challenges inferring, reading between the lines, or they had uh, challenges in deducing the meaning of unknown words from the context, and, and some, something else. So we get kind of a, for certain types of uh, items, we have this kind of profile from the teachers and also from the learners. So designing mediation. Um, so uh, this is, we used, so far we have used um, uh, uh, past ex uh, matriculation exam reading items because re matriculation examination tests are always released to the public immediately afterwards so they're always done anew so you can actually access through the Finnish broadcasting the Ab Abitrainit uh, web website you can actually get access to uh, almost well since 2000 something all the past matriculation examinations are, are, are there so we just slightly modified it. Originally, this this task had uh, three uh, three um, uh, options, and one of which is collect. We we for this project purposes, in order that they would actually have a chance of getting more levels of mediation, we added two more uh, sort of uh, uh, distractors to make it harder, but also allow for the possibility of, of them being uh, exposed to some, some uh, mediation. So, um, I don't know if the, if you want to try to see what, what, the, what the correct answer here could be, you might want to focus on the last few uh, final lines in, in, in the text. And, 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 but but this, is, this is an example of a reading item that uh, predominantly, uh, according to information we got from the from the students and teachers, uh, uh, requires inferring word meanings from context on, on unknown words or terms. And the question is, what is the what is what what is mentioned as a difference between GM and Tesla? So uh, anyway, this is a challenging item, and uh, to sh display if if the learner. Re replies incorrectly for the first time uh, for this uh, construct the feedback would be sometimes you don't need to know the exact meaning of an unknown, uh, unknown word however if you need to know what the word means it is useful to look at the text around the word and 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 also if you have a general idea of the of the of the uh, of what you have read it helps you uh, forward uh, if that doesn't help and you make another mistake, you get more uh, detailed feed, um, advice, which is uh, which could come in a form. Of these are so these are draft versions, but but I think we are moving towards that that direction. So, uh, for example, which word comes right before after the unknown word? Look at that. Uh, then, uh, can you divide the word into parts? For example, if it's if it's something that's divide, uh, divisible, like unhelpful i mean that might give you hints about the meaning uh, is it positive or negative word might lead you some way and and so on and if that doesn't help then here uh, actually there's a feedback that specific to this particular item not just the general skill of inferring word meanings but but to this and there's some some um, advice there and and finally you get a kind of an overview of uh, what, what you might have done done here. So this is a kind of a longer text. Uh, we are also playing with the idea of of letting the learner uh, listen to this, not just read. So we, which would re re reduce the, the amount of reading a bit. So 
Uh, just to uh, come to the end, uh, in the Revit assistant that focuses on grammar and vocabulary, the idea is that the learner uh, brings their own text to the system or chooses a text that has already been input there. Uh, then the learner selects uh, uh, an aspect of linguistic aspect that they want to uh, exercise, like for example discourse markers. And, and then the system creates uh, automatically exercises like gap fills with, with, um, with uh, options, uh, multiple choice options, uh, based, based on, on that so chosen uh, uh, subskill uh, for the text in, in question. And learner takes those and, and when, when they make mistakes, they get uh, um, mediation uh, and it also the system monitors le learner progress across the time. Uh, this is just an example what, what what an item might look like. I don't show mediation here but if you go to some of the past presentations you'll actually have a, have an access to to some uh, sample mediation texts for, for a construct li like this on our website. And this is an example of how the Revita system currently uh, displays uh, feedback. This is, uh, on the right, it's, it's a real one for a Finnish learner, because the system has been around for quite a while. It covers a number of different languages. English is just a new addition. So basically, uh, you are shown which of the grammatical constructs uh, you have actually uh, sort of mastered versus not yet by using different color, color coding. So, but you get the idea of how, how that kind of uh, um, feedback over time can be shown to a learner. And I'll just uh, conclude by, by stating that the, uh, because learners have different abilities and different needs, we think that bringing together dynamic and diagnostic assessment would be helpful to actually provide them with a more appropriate, more individualized feedback and diagnosis and feedback. And, and essential here is actually that dynamic assessment allows us to cover more ground than traditional uh, tests. And by combining the um, artificial intelligence enhanced uh, ex online exercises with what happens in the classroom, we, we hope to actually bring together some of the good sides of both of these worlds. And the next steps we are now going to pilot uh, these Revit mediation exercises more fully and we will start actually a uh, larger scale use of these uh, in, in the participating schools in, in the autumn and it, this includes also workshops for the, for the teachers. And this is the uh, website for our um, project so please go and have a look at there. So thank you. Thank you for the insight. We have time for a couple of questions. Okay, I, I would ask myself that. Or or just yeah. Yeah, right. uh, the question is about the language of instructions. For example, those strategies on reading, uh, those uh, seem to be quite detailed. Mm. Are they provided in uh, first languages or? Of how to yeah. organize the data? That, that's a good question. Actually, we, we, we will uh, actually give the students choice of um, showing, um, showing the uh, mediation and, and we, we also collect some uh, reactions from them. Um, so we give them the choice of actually using Finnish or, or English as, as the interface language. We have um, started with, with English because that is the kind of lingua franca of the project, but, but uh, when we actually, when they actually start, start taking those, then they can actually also. I mean, I think most of them would probably choose Finnish, but that depends, of course, on their choice. Any more questions? Thank you for the excellent presentation. Now you have a question about the AI enhanced uh, mm. activities. So mm. you said that uh, online tasks automatically are created by AI. Maybe can you elaborate? Is there like a human in between or not? And uh, how is AI doing in your opinion? Um, well, this is um, Roman would, would be able to answer this fully. But I mean, uh, they, they, 
uh, what, what is done is that, um, for example, creating um, um, tasks focusing on discourse particles, for example, uh, there is the background, there's a kind of an inventory of different classes of discourse particles that exist in the English language, uh, which is used by the, uh, by, by the system to, uh, to, uh, to, first of all, when it spots um, a discourse particle in the text, sort of it picks, picks that as the correct answer and creates, let's say, a gap for that part section. Uh, then the, the uh, distractors are drawn from the other categories of discourse par particles would, that would have uh, different meanings. And, and, and then um, that's the kind of a non-technical <laughs> explanation of, of, of that. And, and then the mediation would focus on, on drawing uh, learners' attention to the meaning of the of of the of the discourse particle in in that particular text context, and and then moving towards perhaps narrowing down the problem. but but they they use not different kinds of natural language processing procedures developed for, for English to create uh, these exercises. Obviously, these these vary from the different uh, type de depending on the type of. Uh, uh, type of um, grammatical or vocabulary uh, context, but but for uh, for some of them, they have a certain inventories of of items that are possible, like for example discourse particles. Uh, but for um, but for some some more rule based systems, I, I I'm afraid I can't give you a full answer <laughs> about that. Yes, we have time for one more short question. I will ask myself then. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, one comment, uh, the uh, belief uh, that uh, vocabulary, knowing the vocabulary makes you a good reader is, uh, I, I, the, is my impression from our teachers as well and students. That mm -hmm. The belief that if you know the vocabulary, then you know the language. Mm -hmm. But that was just a comment. We just. Uh, uh, but the question I would like to ask, what is your impression, what are what is what what are the overall uh, assessment strategies that uh, teachers of foreign languages uh, use in their everyday teaching um, well um we 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 surveyed that for reading and, and writing to some extent because the the in the, the Finnish gymnasium is very heavily influenced by what what is covered in the matriculation examination and and the, its its language test. Uh, for example, uh, they use a kind of an essay composition for for as as, a, as the writing task. So um, unsurprisingly, that kind of writing task is is practiced quite a lot in in the Finnish upper secondary schools. Uh, so that's that's not not a su surprise. Um, what is um, a bit more broadly the um, uh, the fact that the matriculation examina examination uh, lacks uh, speaking tasks, a speaking section for, for the foreign language tests, which probably has has some influence on 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 the on the um, uh, motivation of, of students and teachers to to practice uh, speaking in, in the upper secondary school, for example. When it comes to um, reading, uh, I think the, what happens is that they, they use uh, reading tasks uh, that are provided by the textbooks, um, paper or, or digital ones, and, and they often seem to mimic the kind of task types that are appearing in the matriculation examination, multiple choice, short answer questions, um, mostly. And, and the question is, of course, what is interesting is that what kind of reading skills are they? Are the uh, textbook exercises and textbook uh, tests that come with the textbooks actually focus on? And we have some some uh, some interesting initial findings about how, how the how initially initially in the first courses in in uh, in the gymnasium uh, the um, the tasks and tests uh, in the for reading in the textbooks actually focus on on very specific details of the text and, and only later, if, if at all, they actually cover a uh, broader ground. Probably they, they do that, but not, not in the first, first years, which is, well, surprising a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much.